Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm the head of the sleep surgery department at the Royal National ENT Hospital in Central London. Now, in this video, I want to tell you about how I help people use CPAP for their sleep apnea. Just in case you don't know, CPAP is the mask that goes on your face that pumps air into your lungs and that blows open the structures in the back of your throat so you don't stop breathing in the middle of the night. Stopping breathing in the middle of the night is called sleep apnea. Now, I think a lot of people know that CPAP is one of the safest ways to deal with your sleep apnea. But again, a lot of people find that CPAP is very difficult to use the whole night for seven and a half hours each night. And that's what we're really aiming for, to use CPAP all the time so that your risk of having complications from sleep apnea, such as heart attacks and strokes and reduced life expectancy, all those things, we can bring those back down to a normal person so you never have to worry about your sleep apnea again. So what I'm going to do in this video is explain what I do to help people with their CPAP devices. Now I'm a surgeon, I don't deal with the CPAP settings and things like that. And actually there are loads of videos on YouTube about changing your CPAP settings so that it makes it more comfortable for you. What I want to do in this video is tell you how I help people from a surgical point of view to use CPAP. So one of the first things I do with people who are using CPAP or people who are struggling to use CPAP is to look at their nose. Now, a lot of people don't realize that CPAP causes a blocked nose or a congested nose. And because when the CPAP's off, you can start breathing normally again, people don't realize that this is a problem. So I'll try and explain why this happens. So the basic structure of the nose is there's, there's a little midline partition here called the septum. And then there's a, the nostrils going in this way as well. But it's not a clear open passage there. There are things inside called turbinates that go in like this. So it looks a little bit like gills if you look at it from the side. When the air passes through, it goes in between these, these turbinates as it goes through the back of your nose. And the point of these turbinates is to warm up and humidify the air as you breathe it in through your nose. The reason why the turbinates do that is because dry, cold air going into your airway isn't particularly good for you. It causes a lot of crusting in your nose. And also it's not easy for your lungs to extract the oxygen from the air if it's uh, very dry, it has to be humidified. Has to dissolve in the water. Now the turbinates are excellent at this job. It's very good at warming up and humidifying the air as you breathe it in, but it's not perfect. It's, it's just a biological system. So if you were to squirt air in very, very quickly, it isn't able to keep up with it. Think of it as a radiator. You've got air passing through and you're trying to warm up the air as it passes through. If it's passing through too quickly, it hasn't got time to warm up that air, or it hasn't got time to humidify that air, giving it more and more sort of water so it saturates the air as it goes through. So what it does is, rather cleverly, if the air is passing too quickly through your nose, or if it's very, very cold or very, very dry, what the nose does is that the turbinates increase in size to slow down the passage of air as it goes through. So it gives it enough time to do its job properly. Now you might be able to see in the case of CPAP, what we're doing is forcing air in at rather high pressures, forcing the air through the nose. And obviously the turbinates get a little bit upset. It's trying desperately to try and humidify and warm up this air that is going through into your nose, but it can't do that. So what it does is it swells up, like I said before, and tries to slow down the amount of air going into your throat. Often the CPAP device senses this and goes, oh wow, there's a bit more extra pressure. There must be something in the throat or something like that. And then ramps up the pressure again by the CPAP to try and overcome this, this blockage that it can now feel coming from the nose. And then they constantly try to compete against each other. And eventually your nose gets completely stuffed up. And you can't breathe at all. When that happens, the pressure is so high, you're pushing so much air to try and get past this blockage in your nose that there's a bit of a leak. You end up waking yourself up and that leak goes into your eye and you wake up and you go oh you try and rip this thing off because you feel like you're suffocating which it kind of you are because your nose is completely blocked and you have a bit of an adrenaline rush because your heart's beating you, you don't know what's happened you can't breathe after a moment you feel like you can breathe again and that's mainly because the adrenaline is surging through your system and adrenaline opens up your nose so you can breathe again depending on what sort of person you are you either say oh, i'm not using that and and you go back to sleep without the cpap on and you end up just getting sleep apnea again or what you do is you you persevere and you say oh, i'm going to put it back into my my nose or put it over my mouth and try again but when that happens the cycle repeats and then you keep waking up in the middle of the night and eventually you go to your sleep lab and say Look, I, it keeps waking me up in the middle of the night I go to sleep all right but it wakes me up a few hours later or, you know even half an hour later I just can't use it and a lot of people don't realize it's because their nose gets blocked so that's why CPAP manufacturers have made 
humidifiers and warmers on their CPAP. So it's like an add-on that you put onto your CPAP. And the idea behind these is that they already warm up the air as it goes into your nose. So the turbulence don't have to do it. They already saturate the air uh, with water. So the turbulence don't feel like they need to do this for you. And the idea is to get good quality air as far as the turbulence are concerned, good quality air going through the nose. So your turbulence don't go, oh no, this is not good enough. And then and then starts swelling up and blocking your nose. The problem is that these turbulence are quite fickle creatures and sometimes it can be too warm or, or too humidified or too saturated the air coming in and then the nose goes oh this is not right and starts swelling up again so you have to get the humidity and the warming settings just right each night I think is slightly different some nights are more humid than others some nights are warmer than others and so you can set it incorrectly and to get the right setting is quite hard and it is difficult and uh, there are devices out there that have better humidity settings than others but getting it just right for you it, it can be difficult what we do as surgeons is go well let's have a look up your nose make sure that your nose isn't twisted the midline septum area isn't twisted and that's not causing a problem or you've got adenoids or polyps and things like that but if it's simply turbinates we just go look why don't you try a, a nasal spray and sometimes i tell people look use a nasal spray before you even start using cpap because it takes a few weeks for nasal sprays to start working i've got a video in my channel that teaches you how to use nasal sprays properly because an awful lot of people just sort of spray and sniff it up and all the the wrong things you people do with nasal sprays use that nasal spray because sometimes that stops these turbinates from reacting so aggressively and therefore allows the cpap to do its job and not to sort of start fighting with the turbinates. In some cases, people go, look, I've tried the spray, I can't use it, it's not working. And then we do need to maybe push them out the way or shrink them down a little bit. But hopefully if you can use the spray and get used to it, keep persevering with the CPAP, it should get to the point where, actually I can tolerate this, this is working very well for me. So I've covered the nose, so what else can I do to help people with CPAP? Now this is the reason why I examine people whilst they're sleeping. If uh, you're watching this video now, you're not snoring or stopping breathing right now. You only really do that when you're sleeping. So what's the point of examining someone when they're awake? So what I do, and you'll see some other videos about this, I, I get people sleeping in front of me in the hospital and then I look down the back of their throat and see which parts of their throat are causing their sleep apnea. And when I know this, I can go to that person after and say, look, look at this video. I've taken this video from inside your throat. This is why you you have obstructive sleep apnea. The reason why you have obstructive sleep apnea is this problem and maybe we could try this. And so one of these things is having a tongue base problem. So the tongue is falling back. So the back of your uh, throat is here and the tongue is falling back and blocking your breathing down there. Now, if that happens, uh, you find it very hard to use CPAP. And I've said in other videos that people who have a tongue based problem find it hard to use CPAP. And the reason for that is that you're using air through your nose or maybe through your mouth. You're pumping air in and you're asking that air to push away the, the bulk of the tongue and also probably your jaw as well. You need quite a lot of pressure to lift that sort of weight you know, against gravity. So that's why a lot of people find who've got a tongue based problem find it difficult to use CPAP. It's sometimes a lot easier for people with say lateral wall collapse and, and other things like that. And you can see videos about those sorts of characteristic types of uh, sleep apnea, uh, anatom anatomical sleep apnea problems. But in terms of tongue based collapse, you can have problems because there's an awful lot of pressure to push that tongue out the way. So one of the first things I do is say, look, why don't we try and get you to sleep on your side at night? I know it's difficult with the CPAP mask, but if you could sleep on your side, that might allow your tongue to flop forward. And, and there are sort of positional devices that you can wear these backpacks. Uh, I've got a video here about that. Uh, or you could use something else like a mandibular advancement device. That's like a gum shield that goes in your mouth and brings your jaw forward and thereby also pulls your tongue away from the back of your throat so the CPAP can do its job without being impeded by this big bulk of um, muscle in the way. But you can also try other things if some people don't have, uh, have problems with dentition. You could try something rather cheap like a tongue retaining device I'll put a link or something to that video there or a INAP device again it's a bit like a straw that goes into your mouth and sucks out the air from your mouth so it draws the tongue forward and draws the palate back so the air can pass down the back so using these things as well as I say a nasal CPAP would work quite well if you're having just nasal CPAP like these pillars that go into your mouth like that it is quite important to close your mouth while you're doing that. So an awful lot of people use nasal pillows. The air goes through there, but, but there's a blockage here. The air just comes out, out of their mouth again. So it sort of circulates this way and you don't get really the, any, any of the benefits. So a lot of people use a chin strap. It goes like this, keeps their mouth closed. So the air that's going through their nose goes down to where it's needed in the lungs and the tongue isn't impeding it. Uh, and that works very well. And sometimes after a while, you naturally close your mouth at night. It also 
with your mouth closed, you stop doing the like this, you keep the jaw forward. And again, I've got another video and I'll try and link it here for you. You can look at these sort of um, chin straps that can keep your mouth closed. Now, some people might say, look, look, I don't have access to drug induced sleep endoscopy that I do. So the new national guidelines in this country have said that everyone should be examined in terms of their mouth before they have CPAP, just in case they've got large tonsils. If you've got large tonsils and you need to look in the mirror or get someone to look at you, if you've got big tonsils, CPAP's gonna find it very hard to blow these tonsils out the way. They're like two little meatballs inside your mouth. It's got nowhere for it to go. So uh, the, our national guidelines say you should remove the tonsils first before starting CPAP, because what you're doing really is reducing the pressure that the CPAP needs to exert to get you to be able to breathe. And if these tonsils are causing a lot of pressure resistance to the airflow, taking those out can really help open up your airway. When the pressures are low on your CPAP, it makes it much more uh, tolerable for you to use CPAP. So instead of you going, you're fighting with it all night, actually the, the pressures are much lower and it's quite, quite nice. Uh, a lot of people find when they're using the CPAP, they sleep very nicely, they wake up refreshed and it makes it all worthwhile for them. Now there are operations you can do on the tongue and the other parts of the throat that can reduce your CPAP pressures and help you use CPAP better. But those are all sort of last resort type things. There are lots of things, as I said in this video, that can help you with your using your CPAP. And a lot of these you can do from home. And once you're using CPAP consistently, at least seven, seven and a half hours each night, you'll find that actually, oh, I can breathe a lot better. I've got more energy during the day. Uh, your levels of hormones which stop you from losing weight also start reducing. So a lot of people don't realize that. People think that, oh, the reason why you've got sleep apnea is because you're overweight, you've been eating too much. Actually, it's normally the other way around. Sleep apnea causes weight gain and sleep apnea stops you from losing weight. If you can be using your CPAP all the time and you use it at least seven hours or some or something like that each night, you'll find that the weight just starts dropping off almost by itself. Obviously, you should diet and drop it off quicker and get you back to a normal person. But you'll find it so much easier if you can use the CPAP every night. And that should hopefully give you some sort of motivation to use your CPAP. If you can use your CPAP, you, you find that your weight drops off much easier. You don't have to work so hard on your diets. Uh, I've got a video on that as well, I'm afraid. But you can look at all these things on my channel and that will hopefully help you use your CPAP. And if you lose all your weight and you're opening up your airway with mandibular advanced advice, all those other things, you might find when you go back to the sleep lab, um, nine months or something later when all the weights come off and you feel much better you might find that you actually don't need CPAP anymore and you feel much better I, I think there's hope I think you should keep going keep fighting uh, and get your life back on track there's an awful lot of people who feel like oh god this is the end of my life but it's not we can help you we can treat you and I really hope that um, all of you get there thank you very much for watching this video take care bye bye